But what kind of excuse do you think I'm gonna get tomorrow when I ask for 20 bucks for gas? Uh, guarantee I can answer that one, but there's no money. Which is bullshit. Yep. Batteries we just plugged into the charger. I'm at 24% on this. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so and there's a gray bag. Don't forget the mod. <laughs> and some, probably some of them, uh, you know what? Go ahead and say whatever you want to the camera, like for real. Um, anything you want to say. It doesn't fucking matter. We may cut it out, so you can literally sing songs. I'm gonna go get <laughs> some shit. I'll be right back. Okay. You got your smokes and everything? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. I just broke the fourth wall. So apparently we're doing an interview series for IWA, uh, the Independent Wrestling Alliance in Ohio. And of course they wanted to start with the best. That's me. Other than that, I have no no earthly clue what the hell is going on here. I do too many drugs for this shit. Man, it's been a long time and a lot of drugs ago since I talked to myself this much. Crazy, so I talk to myself all the goddamn time. <laughs> we ought to get along. Yeah. The real arrogance attitude, not the fake one from Hogan. Uh, <laughs> but a sense a little animosity or just a little. Mm. No, it was just like he tried so hard to be the bad guy, and it was. I thought he was a good guy. Like. He was until '96. Oh yeah, he did. He became a he became a bad. He started right. black or something. And, and I mean, he was a decent bad guy. But as far as like having that arrogant attitude and stuff like that, it was so forced that even as a five and six year old kid, I could, you know, you could, you could see that it, it, it took a long time for him to adjust to that role. Okay. And uh, and, and, and you know that that's my point of view on it, like. So you're, it you're, always seemed forced to me. You're five or six year old, then you you kind of get a little older into your teens, and not to push a sore spot, but how old were you when you discovered? Did you say seventeen? Yeah, I was seventeen. How do you find out you have brain cancer? Um, I was actually at a party, and me and this girl was throwing this. Uh, it was a children's uh, Advil bottle. Okay. And uh, turns out those are glass bottles. I didn't. And, know that. Uh, I, I didn't either <laughs> but um we're throwing it back and forth well somebody had gotten my attention so I turned my back and she'd already thrown it she screams watch out so I turn and when I turn it hit me right behind the ear okay cut my head open got the bleeding to stop but uh I knew I already knew that I had some sort of concussion just from the feelings that I had, the, the pounding headache and unable to focus. I, I just, uh, so, you know, you fast forward a little bit to the next day, this it, it, this cut is still bleeding off and on. Like, it's not. So I'm like, well, I need to go see maybe. You didn't go to the hospital immediately? No. Okay. 
but I was like maybe I need to go see if it needs stitches because uh, I thought I knew what was wrong and I was like not a lot they can do for a concussion you know so I'm at the hospital and done a CT scan and MRI and the doctor comes in and he said it, 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 this whole scenario is the weirdest thing I've seen in my professional career and he I was you know 17 like you know what the fuck are you talking about he said the cut behind your ear isn't severe enough to have kept bleeding as long as it is it, it should have stopped on its own uh, but because it didn't they had to do MRI and CT scan found uh, four four masses on the right side of my brain it turned out that uh, I ended up having uh, four tumors and two cyst so it was like two weeks later they had to go in and remove those and when the test results come back on the tumors it, uh, I think it was like three out of four of the tumors that they had removed were malignant and so I had to have uh, radiation treatment oh, wow. on, on, on my brain just to at 17? yeah you're still in high school though. like I know yeah, you had yeah. nothing to do with it, but yeah, I mean it's it it was crazy. Uh, so what do you do at that point? You go I get mean, the radiation therapy. I'm guessing. I have the radiation. Uh, do you have a girlfriend at this and, time or anything? Yeah, actually, by this time I've got a uh, two-year-old son. At seventeen? Yeah. And uh, me and myself and his mom are still together at the time. Uh, it was at that point where I realized, like, she really didn't give a fuck what happened because uh, I spent close to a week in the hospital. I seen her and my son once for maybe 15 minutes. Uh, didn't even get a phone call uh, from the time I had the surgery until I recovered enough to where I could call them. So, you know, it it showed me a lot about a lot of different things like you know uh and so you know obviously that didn't last very long but uh do you still get to see your kid yeah yeah how old is he for her or whatever don't say the name uh now he's uh 11. you're 27 and you got him 11. yeah i got a grandkid so i mean i'm only 43. uh yeah so you're surviving cancer. Congratulations, by the way. Um, you're in Kentucky. Is it a major city? Like, are you near a major city? Or no, I'm actually. I live in a uh, just a little small town. Uh, it's uh, east of Frankfurt. Is this the town you grew up in? Uh, that you live in now? Or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's... So you get a job. I'm guessing you start muddling through life. And how did you first get in contact with? Like, like how old were you when you started the IWA? Or wrestling, not just IWA, just wrestling. Uh, wrestling in general, uh, I was about eight. Uh, I was eighteen. What, what, what was your? How did? How I did have, you come on the scene, I guess. I have. Did in, you have to uh, come out to your family? Like mom, dad, I'm a wrestler. Oh no, they they always kind of envisioned that that's where it was headed. Like it, there was never any doubt about it. But I. Uh, but yeah, they uh, they helped get me trained and get me get me uh, get me going uh, in the business. Uh, now, what I will say, I, I, I'm not going to go into too much detail about. Let me get the tits on it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> see the tits. I got glasses on. This is a V-neck. But. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I won't go into too much detail about uh, company names or wrestler wrestler names themselves. Uh, other than the IWA, you know, that, that's that's where I'm at now, and that's where my focus is at. You know, they uh, other than the company that did give me my start and give me a chance. You know, IWA is really the only, uh, the one company that's doing everything on their side to 
help get their guys to the next level and you know i'm included with that yeah so you know th that's just that's just where my focus is you know, I, I i don't even i mean it's just always been my thing about it you know focus on your own shit and quit worrying about what other people are doing and you know who i'm talking about you old fucker uh Okay. But, uh... So how'd you end up in the IWA? I come into the IWA late 2014, early 2015. Uh, Bull Miller had just started to uh, try to rebuild the company after he was done wrong and had a bunch of his stuff stolen from it. And that opened the door for me and tag partner I was working with at the time to to get a chance somewhere else and uh actually uh, i worked that show and then I, I was gone for about a year doing other stuff and working other companies and then i got brought back and it's i couldn't see working for another company so actually, another independent company right now this i love the place i love how it's operated it's it just seems so much different than any other place I've ever worked for. So you actually knew Bill, or Bull? Bull, yeah. I don't know anything about Bull, other than he was a wrestler and he owned the place and apparently was an Audrey Cuss, <laughs> <laughs> to, to put it lightly. Can you tell me about Bull? Bull was the kind of promoter that even after his career was over in ring, he still a lot of times was sitting in the locker room with the workers because he wanted to know how how everybody was doing you know what was going on with the matches uh and he he loved to just shoot the bull with people in, in the locker room you know no pun intended on that but that was just to take a hat on him i had some of the longest and best conversations i ever had with that man sitting in the locker room at an iwa show you know uh I've, I've always had a bad temper, and like I had phone conversations with Bull. Uh, like I said, a lot of conversations in the locker room, and he he really helped me understand, you know, like why you you can't let your temper explode in front of a crowd. It just can't happen. He just taught me so much about talking to me, like you know, act this way regardless of what people are doing. You do this. Be be better than they are. You know. Uh, I think the one thing that stuck with me was uh, that first real long conversation I had with him when I come back. He said, "He said you got all the potential in the world. He said, but your temper is going to screw you over. He said, your temper is going to be your downfall. You got you got to learn to control it." The best thing to remember is do what you're asked to do. Make known what your goals are and where you want to be in the company. And if you're doing what you're asked to do, you're going to get what, what, what's coming to you eventually. Like, it, it really, I took it as, you know, work your ass off and do what you're asked to do to the best of your ability but always make sure that those in charge remember why you're there. And that's what I did and it's, it, it has worked and he was right. I think that's the, the, the biggest thing I miss about bulls. There's not gonna be those two hour conversations, or hour and a half conversation on the phone the day after the show on, you know, just, and, and it wasn't even always wrestling, it just, personal shit that, you know, sometimes he'd check in on me and see how I was doing. But so, that's that's the biggest thing that's gonna be missed about Bull, I think, by a lot of people. What are you paying to be in this? What's it cost? Uh I think the biggest thing it cost is, you know, I've done week and a half and two week runs before and 
the hardest part about that is, you know, I'm, I've got small kids. My youngest is two. And the hardest phone call you can get is, you know, when you're, when you're on runs like that and you're three, four days in and you get that video chat with the two-year-old, uh, Daddy, where are you? I, I miss you. Come home. The biggest price I've paid is the time with my kids that I could have had that I didn't. The time with my family um, that wasn't there because I had, you know, there was another town to go to the next day. If you're not careful before you know it, the only thing that matters is the next town. When's the next show? It's... I think the best way to describe it is it's an addiction like no other. There's no cure for it. Uh, you, a lot of people get calls from family that want to go out or friends that want to go do something. I get calls, hey, I'm on the way to a show. You're going to ride with me? I'll be ready in 10, you know, and, and that, that's... Do you just go to like other shows with guys? There's times when I'll, I'll just go and take one in or, or just, you know, take my my youngest daughter and we'll go watch a show or you know just you know I've got downtime off the road like you still want to be around it but you also don't want to leave your kids and stuff to just go so I take them with me and we'll go go to a show with a local show or something you know and that's just kind of how I stay around it when when, when there is downtime Do you, you know at the shows? Sometimes, I mean, there, there's some fans that's been to shows I've worked, and there's a, a lot of the workers on those shows I've, I've worked with, so. Because you're not masked, right? you No, yeah. no, no, no. It's just you. Yeah, and I mean, it, it's it's inevitable when you've been around for a while that, you know, people are gonna know who you are, even if you're sitting in a crowd. And there's times when you can escape by unnoticed, you know. Yeah, the social group is interesting because I mean they're all as fucking crazy as I am so it's it works out <laughs> you know not not every obviously not not every worker has kids or uh, a life to worry about and you know and that, that's just the way that they like like it because they don't have to tell nobody, well, I've got the show coming up, so we can't do this, or we can't do that. It's, you know, the night before, day before, a uh, couple days before, your bag's packed and you're out the door, you're on the road. And I would think, you know, and it's not a situation I've ever been in, you know? So I could, I honestly don't know for myself how that would work, but, uh, I would say it probably definitely makes it a lot easier. And it, you know, you don't have as much guilt or... Well, it's probably uh, about the adventure at that point. Yeah, you don't have as much guilt or regret on you, you know, as somebody that says you got 27 kids and four wives would have. So, <laughs> Are there a lot of fundamentalist Mormons? <laughs> in the I've never street? met one, honestly. Okay. So tell me about the uh, your character. My character is, and for the most part, always has been the vindictive asshole that does whatever he has to do. So, is to... it JD Blaze? Yes. Okay, so who's JD Blaze? Because you guys gotta think this stuff up, don't you? You gotta like motivation, and who's his enemy? Right now, Charlie Brown. Oh, really? Yes. Why do we hate Charlie Brown? Oh, he just don't quit. Like, you ever met those people that just don't die no matter what you do? Yeah. yeah well, that's Charlie. You call him that's Well, I call him Charlie's. So where do you want to go with the, uh, is J.D. Blaze or any other uh, persona? I think my goal is, like, early, early in my career, I had a tryout with one of the bigger companies. And... It didn't go so well. Uh, I let nerves get to me and I blew it. My hope is 
is that I get if I can get one more tryout like I'll be happy I have other independent goals like there is three countries that I want to wrestle in outside of the United States and I'm currently trying to work on making that happen and that is uh, Japan that's Great big. Britain and Canada those are all countries worth being. I can wrestle in one of them I'll be happy but I, I want to wrestle all three countries at least once there's a wrestling boom going on in Great Britain right now and England in general that hasn't happened since the mid 90s and like I want to get to be a part of that if even just for a little while um, so you know there's there's global and worldwide aspirations there it's but you know you you all we, we all have to start somewhere and not not saying that IWA is only a stepping stone because it's been so much more than that to me I, I've been able to achieve a lot of my goals at IWA you know uh, working uh, the bigger name talents uh, that are brought in from the major companies I've got to do that uh, I've Obviously, I'm uh, I'm world champion currently, so that's how's that feel? It's different. Like you know, you you aspire to 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 get to a certain place for so long, and then now I'm there, and now it's like, what's next? You know, and, uh, so. Now it's just more of an aspiration to keep it going. Like I feel like I've got there and I've, I've accomplished what I want, what I've wanted to. But now I can't. If I slip, there is somebody right there behind me waiting for me to fall, and it's not going to happen. It happened. Okay, so you know, honestly, thank you because. I didn't have the ability to make you assholes hate me as much as you do. I wouldn't have the success that I do. So remember that to the next asshole that tries to spit on me or throw something at me. The more you hate me, the more success I'm gonna have. There you go.